weapons don't bring peace. Uh, and the bigger the weapons, the less likely they are to bring peace. And that's been coupled with the program that the Irish government has pursued in terms of Ireland being an international peacemaker, particularly through the UN. Ireland has never developed that um, uh, propaganda or rhetoric or whatever you want to call it, that nuclear weapons keep us safe. I've been involved in uh, Irish CND for quite a while and in a number of other organisations. Um, so what I would hope to do today in the next 20 to 30 minutes or so is to give a quick overview of independent Irish foreign policy through the 20th century to where we are today and then kind of look at where we are today in terms of the challenges and the opportunities that uh, we have uh, in uh, 2022 and looking ahead uh, from here. This past decade has been called the decade of centenaries in Ireland because it marks the transitional period uh, from being part of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland to being the independent or virtually independent Irish Free State by 1922. Um, and uh, Irish foreign policy, uh, I think, was largely shaped by that experience of independence from Britain uh, in the 1920s. And uh, to a large extent, to some extent, it was informed by negative factors in that by being newly independent, Ireland wanted to show that they weren't England. And for, because we had even closer economic ties with Britain uh, um, 100 years ago, very difficult to have an independent, say, economic policy. But foreign policy was somewhere where we could show that we were no longer part of the United Kingdom. So um, that uh, pushed us away from engagement with the English and British uh, army. Uh, towards neutrality, uh, particularly in the 1930s and 40s, that Ireland remained a neutral country in the Second World War. Slightly neutral on the Allied side, um, in that there was a much closer and more friendly relationship with the Allies, uh, which there was not there with the, um, uh, the Nazis, uh, fortunately. Um, and I think another factor towards pushing Ireland into neutrality was that the 1922-1923 period was marked by a very bitter uh, civil war that brought that decade of movement towards independence to a close. Uh, and uh, that experience of uh, civil war where literally brother betrayed brother and family member to death, um, I think... Um, pushed us away from too easy an acceptance of militarism as an appropriate identity for the new Irish uh, state and pushed us towards the idea of more constructive engagement with peace and with building peace both within a fractured country and then looking outwards to how Ireland could contribute to peace uh, internationally. And Ireland's anti-nuclear stance developed really in the aftermath of the uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings and also as the big powers of the day, the Soviet Union, the United States, the UK uh, in particular in the 1950s, raced to test atomic weapons right around the world, often racing to test them in areas associated with indigenous populations in Australia, in the Pacific Islands, in uh, remote parts of the Soviet Union, in Kazakhstan and other places. Um, and uh, the initial developments were with in the late 1950s that uh, Ireland put down a series of resolutions at the United Nations, which eventually uh, led into the Non-Proliferation Treaty um, in 1968, uh, which was eventually ratified in 1970. Uh, with its three strands of non-proliferation of nuclear weapons, nuclear disarmament and the availability of civil uh, nuclear technology for energy and so on. Um, I suppose it can be argued how much the civilian use of nuclear power and the non-proliferation strands have been a success. Um, I think certainly many of the countries which 
could have developed nuclear weapons in the 1970s didn't, so perhaps that can be put down to the impact of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. But certainly the disarmament strand has proved to be a significant failure um, in that the nuclear powers who signed up to disarm in 1970 have not done so and have done the opposite. They have rearmed and increased their armaments and are doing so at the moment. And this posed a dilemma for Ireland as we kind of got a distance out from 1970 um, of how did they combine loyalty with the Non-Proliferation Treaty and pride in what had been a major uh, diplomatic achievement uh, for Irish negotiators with recognition that the Non-Proliferation Treaty really wasn't delivering on what was probably its most important uh, strand in freeing the world from nuclear weapons. And I think Irish diplomats saw the opportunity in the growing movement highlighting the humanitarian impacts of nuclear weapons in the 2000s. And Janet mentioned the establishment of ICANN's campaign in, in Scotland in 2009. Um, and uh, Irish CND became involved with ICANN at a very early stage uh, as well. And I think that provided a refocusing of where we're the possibilities and the opportunities, the opportunity for um, non-nuclear weapons actors to re-seize the initiative from the nuclear weapon states who weren't doing anything. And um, both a refocusing of campaigns for those of us who had been campaigning in civil society for uh, years, but also the opportunity for a global campaign with a focus on a treaty to ban nuclear weapons for states which had been frustrated with the lack of progress there. So that countries like Ireland began to work closely with ICANN and uh, there was a new impetus from countries like Ireland and New Zealand uh, and others towards a diplomatic movement, towards uh, a new uh, legal instrument uh, that would ban nuclear weapons and that would seize the initiative in delegitimizing and stigmatizing nuclear weapons internationally. And in 2015 Ireland was one of six countries which proposed a new nuclear a new uh, resolution at the UN to establish some sort of new legal measures. And in 2017 uh, through two negotiating sessions uh, eventually the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons was approved and open for signature. Uh, Ireland ratified on Hiroshima Day uh, 2020 on the 6th of August and was one of the, the first 50 states uh, when uh, the treaty entered into force in January 2021 and has continued to take part in um, the development of the treaty's work uh, since then. I'll come back to that a little bit later on. Um, in case that all sounds too rosy, obviously there are issues as well uh, with our relation. We um, would have issues with other aspects of Irish foreign policy, uh, the extent to which um, American troops and machinery is allowed to pass through Shannon Airport um, on its way to the Middle East and Afghanistan and, and other places over the past uh, few decades. <clears throat> um, uh, would be one of the big issues in terms of the Irish peace movement and our relationship with the uh, Department of Foreign Affairs. And we've, um, I suppose, Irish CND has enjoyed a good relationship with the Department of Foreign Affairs and we've guarded that because, while sometimes it's very satisfying to be outside on the street protesting outside the doors, when we have an open door, they can get inside and sit down and talk about um what's uh, what's going on then we want to keep that door open and we want to be able to exert that direct influence and direct dialogue explain our position respect the department's positions even where we don't necessarily agree and feel that we are working as partners from different perspectives in diplomacy and in civil society activism uh, towards common goals, uh, even where we're not entirely on the same page. Um, and you know, another aspect, I suppose, of Ireland's engagement with 
international peace, uh, which uh, some of you may have been following this strand as well, um, that yesterday in Dublin, uh, political declaration on the use of explosive weapons in populated areas was signed by, I think, between 70 and 80 countries. I couldn't find the exact figure, but that's another project that we've been working on uh, over a number of years. And it's good to see that coming to fruition. And um, I suppose there's a particular urgency and to a certain extent a poignancy to that um, being signed and formalised at a time when the use of weapons in populated areas is all too glaringly and appallingly uh, on our television screens and our social media feeds and, and everything else from uh, Ukraine. And I suppose in the past year, the landscape of security in Europe uh, in particular, but throughout the world, has been thrown into upheaval by the events in Ukraine and the Russian invasion. and. That has posed a challenge for Ireland insofar as there's the question of how do we share in a common European voice, particularly within the EU, uh, and yet remain distinct as a neutral country in a Europe which is largely dominated by uh, the NATO military alliance. And uh, this has been addressed by the Irish government through vehement condemnation of the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine and Russian military activity in Ukraine. And I think there's a sort of residual sense of Irish identification with Ukraine as that sense of the small country bullied by the larger country next door. Um, I'd be a little bit hesitant about too easy a transfer of the Irish experience with Britain to the Russian relationship with Ukraine. Um, but I think it's a connection that many Irish people can easily make. Um, and alongside that vehement condemnation of Russian actions, um, Ireland, along with Austria, has provided non-lethal aid uh, to Ukraine. So no military hardware or anything like that, but medical supplies and other non-lethal um, uh, logistical supports and this has evoked mixed feelings about the official response uh, among the Irish peace movement. Some feel that it's um, that any engagement is a compromising of neutrality. Um, some feel that it could go further, some people feel that it could be less. Um, I suppose the one thing that is clear is that there are no winners in war and it's very, very difficult to have a right response to war. There is no moral high ground on either side and um, the important thing is that we don't lose sight of the urgency of peace and we don't lose sight of the pathways as many pathways as we can to work towards peace as the vital goal and that we remember the humanitarian impacts and that this is not just about armies and military and victories and those kind of things but it's about children it's about families it's about homelessness it's about people losing everything and facing into a bitterly cold winter and Keeping those things in perspective, I think, maybe can help to focus our minds on the importance of the urgency of peace. Um, and I think in a wider perspective, then, the war also shows that nuclear weapons clearly do not prevent war, as we have been told so many times, and they don't prevent war be engaging nuclear powers. Um, if anything, perhaps it shows that nuclear weapons embolden nuclear armed states to behave with impunity. And it's not the first time that nuclear armed states have uh, engaged in violent actions uh, with impunity. Um, it also shows that the nuclear threat has not receded. And 
there continues the acute possibility of nuclear weapons use today. I mean, we all hope that that does not happen, but um, I don't think any of us can say with certainty that the outlook of the war um, has in any way moved away from the possibility of nuclear weapons being used. And when I see media coverage of the sort of um, well, it might just be tactical weapons, not the strategic weapons that are the, the really bad ones. I get quite a shiver down my spine because most of the tactical so-called weapons in existence today are larger than the bombs that annihilated Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, so um, there's, there's no... Um, there's no nice nuclear weapon. Nuclear weapons are all horrifically destructive, even the ones with a smaller payload that um, have been talked about way too glibly in some sections of the, the media. Um, the other threat that we've seen is the weaponizing of civil, civilian nuclear installations, um, where nuclear power stations uh, become an active military a uh, focal point for um, threat of devastation. Um, and that's something that's a little bit chilling for uh, anywhere that has nuclear weapon stations. It's something that anti-nuclear campaigners have said for a long time, but I think the realisation has been brought home in a much more stark way uh, in Ukraine than we've ever really seen it before. And again, the strategic use of the threat of nuclear weapons has been another dimension that we've seen here uh, and with the Russian threats that nuclear weapons can be used um, and um, the use of that as a tool to gain uh, diplomatic, rhetorical, propaganda, um, psychological advantage within the conflict. And of course any of these, the use of nuclear weapons, smaller or larger, the weaponizing of an explosion at a civilian nuclear uh, plant, any of these would result in unspeakable humanitarian and environmental catastrophe. Um, in the context of that um, war, the Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference took place uh, earlier this year, delayed over the last couple of years because of um, COVID. And the final outcome of that uh, conference was that uh, there was failure to reach agreement on a consensus final report, uh, which was blocked by Russia. Um, I have a kind of feeling that the Russian bloc provided an easy way out for some of the other nuclear weapon states in that um, it meant that they could blame Russia but it also meant that they didn't have to face up to any responsibilities in terms of a document which would um, provide any obligations in terms of uh, highlighting their own commitment and their own failed undertakings uh, to progress their own nuclear disarmament. And in fact, the disarmament sections of that draft final document, which, weren't, uh, which wasn't um, approved, were very weak anyway and had been considerably watered down from both what um, civil society organisations would have wanted and from what uh, states like Ireland and, as I mentioned, New Zealand and others uh, would have been uh, pushing for uh, during the negotiations. Um, <clears throat> and the impact of the nuclear armed states in watering down that final document was very clear to be seen. And um, that is something that has always been a regrettable element in the non-proliferation treaty <coughs> system, that it works by consent. Excuse me a moment. It's all right. I don't have COVID. I just got something stuck in my throat for a moment. Okay. Uh, so sorry. Just to to tell you, you've been speaking about twenty five minutes. That's 
Yes, I'm just going to, I'm, I'm winding towards uh, the last five minutes, don't worry. And I suppose the other element, elephant in the room is the pressing issue of climate change and particularly highlighted by uh, the by the um, COP talks going on in Egypt at the moment. And I suppose we can to some extent see the nuclear disarmament or, or nuclear weapons and climate change as a kind of twin-headed monster of human exploitation of the Earth's resources and abuse of technology uh, through um, the 20th century in particular. Uh, on the positive side, the Treaty on the Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons had its first meeting of states' parties in June, and the Declaration and 50-point Action Plan that came out of that offered um, uh, positive progressive actions compared with the stalemate and stagnation and the shadow of war in the uh, the rest of the things that I've, I've mentioned so far. And... <clears throat> uh, Actions to move forward towards nuclear disarmament involved the setting up of international working groups on vital issues uh, covered by the treaty, like disarmament verification, victim assistance, environmental remediation, and gender and disarmament. And Ireland is the, the coordinator of the complementarity working group, uh, highlighting how the treaty and the, prolifer and the prohibition of nuclear weapons, in fact, uh, works as the necessary extension of the Non-Proliferation Treaty to f fill the gaps in the disarmament article of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. And it was very significant, I think, that this year the Non-Proliferation Treaty draft document included its sections which were clearly influenced by the TPNW's work, particularly in relation to gender. And I think that's a sign of how the goalposts have shift, shifted the ban treaty, the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, is impacting even the very slow-moving and largely stagnated NPT process and giving new life in vital areas there. And we've seen a steady growth in signatories and ratifications of the NPT, uh, now up to 91 signatories, almost half of the UN membership and 68 uh, members, 68 full ratifications. And this year we've seen changing stances in countries like uh, Australia, also Germany, Netherlands, Belgium, countries which are members of NATO, who took part as observers in the uh, TPNW meeting of states parties. Um, and all of this, I think, helps with the delegitimising of uh, nuclear weapons, uh, reflected also in divestment from uh, nuclear weapons companies, which, of course, is massive business. Over $82 billion spent on uh, nuclear weapons in 2021. And there's a growing movement among pension funds and universities and, and others to reject investment in both arms companies and fossil fuels. I'm very pleased that the university I attended and I used to work for um, in the last few months has divested both from fossil fuels and from, nu and from nuclear arms companies and others uh, in the uh, following years of campaigning for them to, to do so and has paved the way hopefully for other Irish universities to, to follow suit. And in the aftermath of Irish ratification of the TPNW, um, all Irish state funds divested from nuclear arms uh, companies. And that, I think, is also creating a momentum away from uh, weapons uh, companies, the weapons industry, and is a big opportunity, I think, for campaigning organisations, even when we live in countries which may not be close to signing or disarming anytime soon. Um, there are other things that are still effective actions that can be pursued, and I know that Scottish CND has engaged with this uh, as well. I don't think there's going to be a drastic overnight shift, but it is that building of a momentum that is important. Um, since I started speaking, the UK has spent about a quarter of a million pounds on nuclear weapons. That money could be very well spent on tackling climate change, 
on the health service and education on so many other things. And that's a very important focal point, I think, again, for campaigning around the world. There are so many things that we can spend this money better on and awareness of just how much money is being spent on weapons of mass destruction, I think, is really important to raise. Um, uh, but I think the impacts that we can see and the moves that we can see even in a non-nuclear weapon uh, disarmament friendly country like Ireland, in terms, like Ireland in terms of disarmament, in terms of the promotion internationally of disarmament, in terms of divestment, do show the importance of campaigning and um, of working together uh, with other like-minded campaigns and of working together internationally uh, to achieve our goals. And as I said at the start, it's been a pleasure to join you in a little bit of that international partnership uh, in speaking to you this morning.